Jeff Grubb is an editor at GamesBeat and one of the most prolific games journalists working today. Known for his incredible sources, diligent reporting and more than a few high profile leaks, you've probably read a report about an unknown game in the past 12 months that he wrote. When not working at GamesBeat or hosting his podcast, Last of the Nintendogs, he's also the host and snack master of Grub Snacks, a new weekly show for Giant Bomb in which he discusses the biggest news and rumours of the week. I caught up with Jeff to discuss his career, what he thinks of the current state of video game reporting, and to see if he'd bring along any Grub Snacks. Jeff Grub, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm really happy to join you. Thank you very much for making the time. You're one of the busiest people in the industry right now, so it's uh, very kind of you to join us. I wanted to talk broadly about your career, and I think the best place to start is to ask you how you got into actually covering games, because you've spoken a bit previously about jobs you've had before you got into the industry, but oh, yeah. what was it like getting in? Uh, it was like a long, slow process that sort of feels inevitable now, only because it, I can't imagine it going any other way. But it was... um. It was something I always wanted to do. I, I liked, I you know, I love games, I, and I really liked the game coverage I grew up with. A big part of my my childhood and my adolescence was reading video game magazines and kind of getting that that language and that verbiage from those people that I looked up to. It's at sites or websites like One Up, but also magazines like EGM, and uh, realizing I thought those people were very cool, and it was it seemed like a cool job. And also, I wanted a job that would make it okay for me to continue playing games a lot as an adult. And, and so, I, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I never really went to college. I went to like I did a few quarters at um, at a community college and stuff. It was, you know, I, I was always someone that uh, never studied and did a, did pretty good on the tests for someone who never studied and stuff like that. But I was, I was never like a, you know a proper education kind of guy so uh the way that i ended up learning was just starting to do stuff starting to write and starting to write and then when podcasting started trying to like make a few podcasts work and getting in front of other people and uh and, and at a certain point it was just you know it was luck you you get to a point where you are in the right place at the right time and someone needs help and that's what happened to me someone needed help at bitmob and uh bitmob.com which is a site that a former egm guy uh, dan shu he started that and uh that's how i got in front of dan shu and he they him and his team of editors basically mentored a bunch of us and i was one of those people and that was a great way to learn to actually do the stuff and get immediate feedback from a professional uh that's how i learned to do this and it you know it, it, it was just one lucky break after another after that like uh, one thing i've learned is everybody works hard everybody everybody is working hard um i i really uh bristle and everyone thinks and anyone's like you know, lazy or just lucky. Uh, no, everyone's working hard. Uh, the, the the difference a lot of times is just those lucky breaks, and I got a couple of those. And what kind of era was that? What were the what were the first few games that you were covering when you got into the industry? So I I had been doing stuff before this moment, but this moment that that sticks out to me of like this is how I sort of um I choose or how I define the era for myself is when. I went from Bitmob to actually starting to get paid for the job because Bitmob was like a, a volunteer thing. And I was like getting paid in that mentorship, basically. Um, when I went to GamesBeat and VentureBeat, it was because Mass Effect 3 had just come out, I think. And uh, it was there was some issue with the face import from one of the games. It might have, yeah, because this was like 20, it must have been 2011 or something like that, 2012 in that time frame where, yeah. And, and I remember like, hey, I'm like, hey, this is broken. I, I'm, I'm talking to a bunch of people, it's broken. Dan Shu, do you want me to come? Because he had moved to Venture Bay. I'm like, do you want me to come do this story freelance? He's like, okay. And he's like, he got me in the system pay system. And that kind of made it easier to continue to do stuff going forward from that point. So kind of just, you know, you just, the door is closing in front of you and you just sort of nudge the foot in as it's closing and say, well, well hey, can I come in there with you? And uh, sometimes you have to do that. I'm not very good at that, but in the, like in that key situation, I, I took that moment, and I did that. But yeah, it was right around that Mass Effect 3 uh, launch was when I kind of got in this professionally. Before, like at that time, and for a long time after that, I was doing... um. Uh, I was still like doing delivery and stuff at like Jimmy John's and things like that. That's those are the kinds of jobs I was doing. In the kind of subsequent few years between you joining GamesBeat and how it is now, what was that process like of developing your voice and what the voice of the site ended up being? I, I think for in those early days, it was a lot of just like, let's learn to write correctly like learn learn actually the, let's get some basic rules here so that your writing is acceptable 
And then you can start developing some other stuff. And, you know, working, you know, Shu and, you know, a bit mob Demian Lynn and, uh, you know, a few other guys, Jason Wilson, who's, you know, still editor at, at GameSpeed right now. Uh, you know, th these guys are people who've worked in print and newspaper and stuff. And so, you know, they they wanted stuff to meet a certain threshold. And when it, when you didn't learn a lesson the first couple of times, they get, you know, pretty frustrated, but they kept at it and they still gave you a chance. And, uh, and so a lot of it was just learning those basics. And then after some time, um, they also, but they, they, even then though, they were given like you free reign to define your own voice and try to say, Hey, uh, you know, make it fun for you. This is, we are writing about games. Let's try to make it fun. Like you have, you have some responsibilities here. We have our code of ethics. We have all these things that we need to, uh, you know, meet a certain threshold of, but then after that, you do need to bring personality into it. And so, uh, for a long time, you know, and whenever I would do that, they would give great feedback, be like, this is great do more of this. Uh, this is really fun. This kicker on the story is really funny, you know, a good little stinger there at the end, people are going to appreciate that. And so that was very encouraging. And it helped kind of, uh, you know, after doing this for years and years, uh, you know, get a voice that I think people started to respond to where once, you know, you know, I do did, did start getting notoriety. It's like, well, there's something there, like there's substance, it wasn't just like oh he's got some scoops there's some scoops but there's some personality there and people really respond to that and you talk about how um you're influenced and mentored by people like dan shu do you think that has influenced you now when newer writers come to you to give that kind of feedback because i feel like those roles are somewhat disappearing in the space of yes. people that are willing to take someone new under their wing and tell them how to do it because it is so cutthroat and the amount of actual yeah. employment opportunities are disappearing daily. So how do, how do you think that's influenced you now? Yeah, there, I mean, there's a couple things there where um, it, it is a little bit different. When they were doing it, they were coming out of a world where there was a lot of money in writing about games. Uh, it, it sounds like a weird thing to say these days, but back then it was like, you know, they... They were getting, they were, you know, they had huge budgets for like, just for their cover art on EGM. I remember I talked to John Davison, who's over at IGN now, and he would tell me, he's like, yeah, that we got, we used to have, you know, $10,000 to up to $100,000 to spend on this stuff. I'm like, wow, okay. Uh, so they were, they were coming from a different world where like, yeah, once they had one of those jobs, it was, the, you know, they did their job and they had their one week where they were crunching to get the magazine out and, uh, and all that stuff. But they had some time to like do other things like mentor people. Um, and, and, you know, they were, this happened during the transition from like when print in the, in the United States was going away and everything was going to websites. Um, but they were still coming out of this world where like they could take that time. Now, um, you mentioned I'm busy. I'm pretty busy. I got, I have, um, I have the game speed, the day job. I'm doing a show over at Giant Bomb as a contributor. I have, uh, you know, my personal podcast that I run all on my own, not with any like help from GameSpeed or anything like that. Uh, I do some stuff on YouTube and I guest on a lot of podcasts and stuff like that. And I think that like, where it comes in, like where the, you know, tr thinking about the next generation comes in is uh, giving some real key pointers when you can. And those pointers come down to what I learned have worked, uh, what, what I have learned does work. And that is, um, don't like have the ambitions of like moving up and becoming one of the cool kids as uh, is the, which is how I viewed it where I was like I'm gonna go be friends with Dan Shu or whatever and that's not really how it works even like when I was in that situation they they have their they have their group they have their click you need to be looking around and seeing people who are next to you who are trying to move in the same direction and become friends with them create the next click and uh you know, that's why I've been working next to Mike Minotti, who is my, uh, you know, my co-host on, on Games Beat the Sides and the Ten Dogs, our podcast. And we work at Games Beat together. And but we got started on like the one up blogs. We were just friends there and have you know, grown side to side by side this entire time. And that has made it a lot easier. So make the next click. And then when one of you gets to a point where like you did move forward, reach back and bring your click forward, bring your friends forward. Cause that, and, and if someone's probably going to do the same for you. So that, that's what I found out, found out has worked for me. You're going to end up working with like almost everybody eventually in one way or the other, whether they go to PR and you work with them like over email that way, setting up some story or something like that, or you change jobs and now you're working with them. Uh, it's just, it's just a super small world. And so it does help to have a short-term memory about being slighted. Uh, and it, it it does help to try to, to slight as few people as possible. And then they have good humor about stuff and just like, let things go. It's not worth festering over most things. Um, you know, I, it's, 
And then, you know, I say this and people are like, what, what, like, they're like, what is it like there? Well, what is gaming like? It's like, no, it's not that big a deal. It's just, you know, there's occasional pettiness and you just, you got to let it go. I mean, we, there's always like, there's a couple uh, Twitter accounts like Game Journos Beeves. And these things were much more popular before 2014 and before like there was like an onslaught from, you know, Gamergate or whatever. And, and we've become a lot more chill since then. But before that, it was like, we were kind of at our at each other's throats all the time. Like, uh, and, and th that stuff has calmed down. And for the most part, most people recognize that um, collaboration is way more important than competition. We're like, we're not really competing. No one's really competing. We're not even competing with YouTubers. You can collaborate with them as well. Uh, it, it is, um, it, it, you know, it's a Reagan thing, and I don't think it works in the in the context that he meant it. But in this context, you know, a, a rising tide does lift all boats. The more people that get interested in gaming because they consume whoever's content is going to create someone who is more willing to to consume your content, even if they didn't start that way. So collaborate collaborate get everyone working together and we, we, you know it's so it's small enough that they're yeah it's cutthroat but if you're collaborating you have a much better chance of succeeding than if you're just trying to cut someone else out um and now flashing to today and your kind of day-to-day -day role in game speak can you tell me a bit about what that's like from someone that may not quite understand your role they see your strap line and your name on stories but they don't know what the day was like beforehand actually getting that together if you could talk on that for a bit yeah, so it's um, one thing we do at Gamesbeat. We had a small team, uh, so we try to let everybody kind of be themselves and 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 cover the stories they want to cover and cover them in the way they want to cover them. Uh, and and so we spend a lot of our days just sort of thinking about what we want to write about. We try to get away from uh, just the daily news grind of take a PR statement and put it on the website. You know, there's still some of that, but we've found we have a lot more success when we are trying to think of good angles and coming at that stuff in that way. So we spend a lot of a lot of our time thinking about that stuff. One of the questions we ask the most often is what would push this story forward? And so we spend a lot of time doing that. And then when we decide what we're going to do, we start talking to people, we send emails, we try to make some phone calls here or there, and try to get some input from, you know, experts and analysts and stuff like that and go and, and, and write the story. When it comes down to like, you know, like when I, if I'm going to write a scoop, I try to spend some time you know, checking in with some sources that I know are reliable, bouncing things back and forth, trying to say, hey, I heard this. Have you heard anything? Seeing if I can get a few more tidbits here and there to, to flesh out a story. Um, but then a lot of it's just writing. You know, a lot of the day, a lot of the day is just writing. Like, that's what it is. Like, there's very little time during the workday to play video games. Uh, it's, I think it's probably a thing you've heard a lot when you have these conversations. It's, it's, it's hard to actually play the games um, during the day, at least. You got to do that on your own time. Uh, something that we, we also talk about a little bit. We also try to find ways to make that a little bit more of a, a, an equitable balance than what it used to be, where it was like, no, if you're reviewing a game, that's all on your own time. Uh, we're trying to be a little bit more mindful of that. But for the most part, yeah, it's, it's just a lot of writing, trying to get content up on the site, um, setting up you know, making sure that the podcasts are ready to go and we're going to post those and stuff like that. And, and yeah. Uh, and, and then meetings, you know, having meetings about what we're, what we're going to do next and stuff like that. It's, you know, it's, it's a job, man. It's just, it's like, so it's like gotta be like so many other jobs and, uh, and that, that's what it feels like. And uh, you, you talked about the, the process of kind of working through a news story. We spoke to uh, Patrick Klepik about, um, news and that kind of chase of breaking news when you have, yeah one source on something and it's something huge and you're desperate to try and get that back yes. up to go to press with it what has your experience been with that and there's is there a moment where you were so sure on something but you just couldn't go with it because you only had that single source yeah definitely uh I, well i try not to be so sure about anything i try to be uh i, I try to sit back and not um make it about what i think in, in certain situations there are Certain sources that, um, uh, you know, I've said this before that I treat it as like the, the horse's mouth where um, I know what they have access to. And it would almost be like if, uh, you know, Shigeru Miyamoto told me something, it would be like, it would be similar to that, where like I could just print, if Shigeru Miyamoto told me something, I could just print that without a second source. Um, it's not exactly that level, but it's, it's, to, it's like that. Um, uh, but in most cases, in many cases, you know, 90% of stuff I hear doesn't, no way does it get printed, doesn't get mentioned on podcasts, because you just need to get that second source, because there's just so many ways these things can be wrong, can be misinterpreted. Um, it is a game of telephone. 
And um, and really, that's what the job is. That's what journalism is. It is eliminating the variables from the game of telephone. You're you're gonna you're you're dealing with people's memories and people's uh, you know faulty interpretations. And the best way to rub off those rough and imagined edges is to get a second source, a third source, wherever you can, to say, okay, here are the details that were repeated to me, and that I can now repeat to the public with some confidence because this is because when you hear it from multiple people independently. Yeah, that's that's the job. Um, and that is it's frustrating. It's a lot of work. It's, um, you know, you, you hear you, you hear things. One of the things that does happen is when people when stuff stuff starts like getting rumbly, uh, like in public on Twitter or Reddit or something like that, where you start to hear something, you're like, I've heard something about that before. I bet I like this happened right around E3 with the 2K stuff where um, some 2K games leaked like that Marvel XCOM game and stuff. Yeah. Um, I saw that post and I'm like, I think I've heard about this stuff before. I'm going to go check. And so I'd be like, I've heard about it before. There's this Reddit post. I'm going to go talk to a really good source. They say it's real. Now I can go out and I could just post. And, you know, Jason Schreier did the same thing. But like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, no, I, I can confirm this as well. Like this is this is stuff that's happening. And a lot of times that's that's how it goes. Other times it is like, you know, getting like some primary information and then spending a few weeks trying to find any way to, to verify it. And that's. So yeah, a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun when it actually plays out and um, people seem to appreciate it. And that's what, that's, what's worked for me. Do you think that there is an absence in the industry of that kind of journalistic rigor, especially when things are so based on leak subreddits? I see a lot of sites yeah. proclaiming to be news when they are just posting unsubstantiated claims as opposed to reporting it as a report, like when the Call of Duty stuff all leaked and VGC was hit with a DMCA despite the fact they were just reporting on the fact that it had leaked it on Reddit, which they were totally clear to do. Do you think mm -hmm. that people like yourself, like Jason Schreier, like Andy Robinson are kind of unique in the sense that you go through those elements of journalism before going to print? Uh, unique might be a bit, a bit strong. It's just, uh, it, there is a, a thirst out there among the public for someone to aggregate all of the rumors. And so a lot of it is just people responding to the market. And, um, I, I, and I understand that. And I, I, I always try to be mindful of algorithms and responding to just the most base desires of people. But, you know, it's like at a certain point, like we do on, on the podcast, we have conversations where we talk about some of these rumors more freely and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm part of it as well, as well. Um, but, when, when it comes to the reporting and actually trying to rigorously determine the truth, uh, yeah, that, that stuff is time consuming and therefore expensive and therefore pretty rare. And also, uh, if you don't have a good, if you don't have good sources, like it's hard to, it's hard to build sources. Like there's a reason like people don't really try to, com like, to compete too much with Jason Schreier on the kinds of stories he does because it he's the one that has all the sources and it would take so long to try to do that. And then all you're going to be doing is telling the exact same story he's going to be telling. So you might as well just try. That's what I did. I tried to find a different way of using my sources to like build an audience and, and it's worked for me, but it's, that's difficult to do. Like the sources is the hardest part of this. And if you don't have that, you could do, you can have all the rigor in the world. You can have the, the highest standards in the world and it's not going to matter. You're never going to print anything because you're never going to be able to verify anything. So, uh, the, you know, and I spent years in that situation. So I, I, I respect that. But, but at the same time, I, I do. I, I bristle at um, at some of the websites that post almost anything that is that is clearly just about the SEO and about getting people to click on Google News or whatever. I remember before the PlayStation Five got revealed, like as a, like the physical unit, so many sites saying, "Hey, this is the new PS 5 and it's like some render, some fan render. And in the story, they'll mention that it's a fan render, but in the headline and the strap, everything, they're saying, "Hey, this is the new PS 5 and uh, it gets on Google News and does really well. And it's like that. Oh, they just lied. They're just lying, and that's how they're doing this here. And it's like that's like uh, that frustrates me quite a bit. But also, there's not much I can do about it. And most most of the audience most of the people who are keened in to what i'm writing about that um you know knows the name jeff grubb at this point uh, they kind of do understand when a site is lying and when a site's trying to actually report something and uh so i'll just keep writing for that audience and doing my best and have you ever faced any kind of backlash from publishers or developers based on what you've reported whether that be um leaks or anything of that nature 
yes. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, I've gotten a few angry phone calls. My editors dealt with most of them. Um, uh, conversations it's like, hey, just, you know, maybe hey, the thing is, is that, you know, we um, we always try to give a, a companies a chance to respond. I'm not, you know, a, cu a couple of times I might have done that on short notice and that that's been unfair of me like a couple of times. But m m most most of the time I'm trying to say, hey, we're going to write the story and please give us full here's a full, a full like you know day to respond to this stuff if you want to you know get in on it and most of the time when i do that they're fine um but you know i think it was like mass effect and Ma i reported mass effect legendary edition was going to get announced in october and it, they hadn't even revealed that the game existed yet and um and you know all this stuff was true it's just then they in internally delayed it which is not a real delay they're just moving their timeline around that they haven't announced to anybody and so uh, I, you know, when that happened and I, 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 you know, I came out immediately and said, Hey, they're going to, they're going to push this. And, um, but uh, EA's like, Hey, this is causing a lot of stress with the developers. And I'm like, yeah, I, I get that. And I, re I respect it, but I don't write for the developers and I don't write for the publishers. And I'm sorry that this is causing stress. I write for my audience. And uh, as far as I could tell, uh, my, my audience you know deserves is a, is a strong word but as far as when it comes down to like me deciding what i'm going to write about if i have this information i know it's true my audience deserves to know uh i write for them i, I and and so it's it is um a precarious position it's not one that i love being in and it always it, it gets me a little bit sick to my stomach sometimes but in the end if i know something's true and accurate uh most of the time i'm going to report it and uh and the, the one times the, the, some, the times that I wouldn't have, like I wouldn't have with Dead Space, but we um, like everyone guessed that one. And then a bunch of other websites was like, hey, Dead Space is happening. So I'm like, OK, I'm not, I'll write the story, too. We, I was just like, Dead Space is so close. A couple of weeks, everyone's going to find about it. It's going to be their big one last thing. Let's just let it happen. There's a bunch of speculation now. People are mostly getting it. But once it started getting confirmed by a bunch of other websites, it's like, OK, I'll just come out and do it. But most of the time, I just want to get that information out there to my readers. And one of the ways you've been getting that information out recently has been on Grub Snacks, your new uh, show for Giant Bomb Premium members that you mentioned earlier. What was the process of um, creating that show and being part of that group? Because obviously yeah. you came in during a moment of huge transition for Giant Bomb. It's no secret that this website was founded very much in the mode of Giant Bomb in that kind of close-knit group. So what was that like from your perspective as someone that was coming in from the outside? I am a huge Giant Bomb fan. Um, that's one of the things is that I'm a big fan of a lot of you know the websites and that I consume right now. Like I'm like, hey, I just like love reading your stuff. I love watching your stuff. Um, you know, I love a bunch of YouTubers, but Giant Bomb's definitely one of the ones I'm like. I've listened to every one of your podcasts for ten years plus now. Um, and so when uh, they they had a bunch of guys leaves basically, but like, many of the core members left, and uh, I was like, oh man, what's going on with Giant Bomb? And then like a day later. Uh, Jeff Bacalar, who got kind of uh, was at CNET, and then he moved in the position of being like, you know, once they got acquired by Red Ventures, he moved into a position of like strategy for all of their gaming content. And he reached out and he's like, hey, you want to want to like talk? I'm like, yeah, sure. And, he's like, and then we talked. And he's like, Do you, maybe we can have you on. Like, you're one of the first names on the list. I'm like, wow, that's really flattering. That means a lot. I was very skeptical though at the beginning because I'm like, uh, I know what Giant Bomb is. It's a it's a bunch of you know people who are close knit, like you described working together and creating content together and that uh, camaraderie and so the rapport they have is a huge reason why that stuff works and so while i would love to have a show on giant bomb is that gonna make sense and this is what i was thinking and like of course i like when jeff backler was telling me i'm like yeah yeah i'll definitely do it i definitely do it because i'm not gonna say no but it, like internally i had this, this skepticism um but jeff backler made a good pitch where he's just like we're gonna try a bunch of stuff we're gonna bring our friends in there's still gonna be this giant bomb core content uh like you're gonna be a contributor we're gonna have people come and contribute and bring a little bit more different flavors to what what we're doing and I'm like, you know what? I think as long as like people can still come and listen to the Bombcast every week, uh, there maybe there's a space for this stuff. And uh, we started up the show, and it was the first. I was the first like contributor show to to debut as part of this like new idea of what Giant Bomb was. And the response was just it was almost universally positive. People were so nice. People have been very kind. They come and they watch the show. They they give me questions. They watch live. We interact, and people have just been so nice. I I was kind of like blown away, and I'm like, okay. This audience is very receptive. They they want to see new stuff. They want to they want to take chances. They're willing to give me a chance. That means a, like so much to me. And uh, it it's been great. It's been great so far. I really love doing grub snacks. As someone that's 
part of the community and like you has listened to the podcast since they were in that basement over 10 years yeah. ago um it was a really exciting time in terms of the the new content and certainly from my perspective you fit in straight away like that episode of the podcast that you were on it felt like you had been on that podcast for five years at that point so i think well that's the thing with like I, i've listened to the episodes where they have guests on and i'm a, i'm someone who um when i listen to podcasts i like the core crew i don't like guests very often but there's a few people who've like fit in really well because they and you could tell because they listen to a lot of episodes and so or like like they, they're a regular listener or like a regular consumer of giant bomb content and so they get in and they immediately like they understand the end jokes they understand when they're supposed to step in and stuff and i was trying to like have that vibe about it and uh again i got a lot of good response about that as well and it's like yeah well, you know, they've asked me to be back on the bombcast a couple of times and it's just got like scheduling conflicts i'm like i need to find time to like clear that zone in case they ever ask me on again because i would love to be on the bombcast again but it's like three hours in the middle of a tuesday and i'm like that's not i'm not used to like needing that much time on a tuesday uh but i yeah i loved being on that bombcast and it was they just they are they're nice they know a lot about games they like they 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 are willing to have whatever conversation and all that stuff is just such a good environment to like just go in there and shoot the shit and i i really enjoy it what really drew me to uh you originally was your ability to just have someone give you a publisher and a general name of a game and for you to be able to just like go into the back of your mind and be like this is what's happening with this this is what how do you build up that level uh, of knowledge yeah. because among <laughs> among this website i get made fun of for having played every video game released in the past 10 years and can just relay their release dates but how do you do that with things that don't even exist yet <laughs> um so uh, it's it's a thing that I think uh, you know not to like toot my horn or that it, it naturally fits with the way I think about things where I am um the first part is like you can be an expert on anything if you read about it for an hour a day for 10 years or something like that or maybe it's two <laughs> years it's like two years if you read about something for an hour a day for two years straight you'll be an expert on it and that's like i, I didn't say that I mean, there was probably some malcolm gladwell bs but but whatever you know I, I tend to think that's probably pretty accurate i've consumed gaming related content uh, nonstop my entire life. And so I, I have all this like uh, experience, like this, you know, secondhand experience to draw on. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to just like reading and listening to people who are smarter than me. Uh, you know, I mean, Gerstmann's a great example. Jeff Gerstmann over at Giant Bomb, he, he thinks about games in a really, really sharp way and he has good ideas. And if you like let yourself like think about his ideas and then like build off of them, you can, you, you like, that's like a really good starting place is to like let other people inspire you. And then you start thinking about like what that could mean for these different companies. And a lot of it also comes down to listening to, uh, investor calls and uh, and reading reading quarterly earnings reports and stuff like that, and understanding like listening to CEOs when they talk and um and then listening to analysts and investor like the actual investors and saying like what they're interested in right now and understanding how that those desires inform the desires of the people the executives at these companies and just trying to like put, build a link and also it comes down to um like having wider interest. I'm very much into economics. I listen to like a million economics podcasts. I've been reading a bunch of economics books and you know, you, you, you piece one of these interests together with the other thing and you're like, Oh, all these things are just sort of working together in the way that every business works. And, uh, and w when you kind of piece all those things together over time, it becomes easier. Um, a lot of it also just comes down to good sources and understanding like what these companies are trying to do right now. But but yeah, it's just uh, kind of being in a, in a position where all of my, all of my, all of the stuff that I'm into is just working together in, in, in a way to enable me to talk about these things and in, in, at length. And so, I, I I had an idea I could do that. I didn't realize that like, oh, people are going to be like giving me questions about all kinds of stuff, and I'm going to be able to speak at length about that. And I guess I didn't even realize I could do that until I started doing grub snacks. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been fascinating. It's been fun, and I'm I'm like okay, I'm glad I have that skill because it's serving me very well right now. Now, before I let you go on with the rest of your day, we have been, uh, we have a list of things that we've been predicting on our podcast, the Overload podcast, all year. And uh, we'll call this Grub Snacks to Go. You can give me yes or no. Yeah. You, can, you can go more in depth if you want. Does Halo Infinite make it out this year? Yes. I think at this point, I'm more confident about that than I, than I have been all of this year. Um, it's it's a game that has had its issues uh, very publicly, but mm -hmm. like internally, like the, like I think um, you know the single player I think has had more problems than people even realize. But 
that's true for a lot of games. We know that's true for a lot of games. I think a really good resource to look at this is the um, the documentary about the making of, Cre- of, 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 of God of War, the 2018 one. And understanding that, like, even that game people thought was bad up until, like, the last six weeks. Um, so while it's not great to have a bunch of uh, tumultuous development cycle and it's not um, ideal, it's it's normal. It's, it is it is part of the game making process. And so while those issues exist and the game has been delayed for a year, I think it's starting to come together. And, uh, and you know, a big part of that is it got rated. Like they're, they're submitting it for rating. Like they're moving forward with it and they don't want to have to uh, delay all of their like marketing partnerships again, which they already did. I guess if they delayed it like a couple of months, it wouldn't be that big a deal. But I think they're they want to see this one through. They want to yeah. get it out. They know that they can have a really really solid holiday, even if the single player comes out and it is like, okay, this did still need time in the oven. Uh, if the multiplayer is solid and it's you know it's free, it is free. Uh, it's going to take up so much like space in that vacuum of the holidays, where it's like this is a thing so many people are talking about at least for a couple of weeks through those holiday periods. Um, the the single player game will get like yeah, it'll get roasted a little bit, but it'll have a chance to do the thing that we've seen so many times now of get those updates, get to a good place, take in fan fan feedback, and and they'll do that if they need to. Uh, and I think they will try to get the game into that position where. Yes, let's get that. Let's get the multiplayer out. Let's get the single player out as best as we can with the understanding that people might be mad at it or it might not be good enough. We I don't know yet, but maybe that's the situation. And if it's not, we're just going to make promises to see it through and keep making updates. And we'll do the see if these see if these thing we have, if we have to where a couple years later it'll be like the game that everyone's talking about about how people can't stop playing it because we just did so much good work to it. So yeah, I think it comes out interesting because our my speculation all year has been they will get the multiplayer portion out this year so that they can say possibly on the anniversary of combat evolved so they can say they have this out and that the single player would slip somewhat but yeah it feels like something that microsoft really don't want to they don't want to have to make that twitter post again because it would be such a it would be the most dunked on thing in history. There are cans of Monster right. that had Master Chief on them that are now expired. Like it has been mm-hmm. such a long delay at this point, but I, I don't know. It was when they didn't give it a date at E3 when we were watching that. We were like, that's that's suspicious. Well, but I suppose they're just being cautious. Well, because... that's, the, that's the thing we talk about on Grub Snacks a lot is, is that developers don't need to do that anymore. They, yeah. they can wait until two months out, one month out to give dates now because uh pre-orders are less of a thing especially for a ga- any game on game pass pre-orders are just not as important as they used to be so uh part of like getting pre-orders is saying here's a date well now you know the date you need to act you need to act now you need to go and put your money down and pre-order this game that was so important to the success and the viability of video games you know 10 years ago now it's not now it is uh you can say a game's co- like even like for ga- big games that aren't on game pass like you could just say it's coming two months from now and people are going to buy it digitally and they're going to find other ways to buy it. And they're going to, it's going to have long legs. Miles Morales is still like in the top five on the MPD every month in the United States. Uh, these games have longer tails. They, they last longer. They look good for longer because gra- graphics have had those diminishing, diminishing returns. So you don't have to be so emphatic with the release date. And, it, it, and what we've seen w- with games that have done this is it hasn't hurt their sales. They've been just fine. So we are going to be in a world where, the the time between getting that date and the actual release date is going to just shrink and shrink and shrink and they're going to just keep it closer to the vest everyone is i mean we we've, we're going to we're seeing this with sony we're seeing it with microsoft we've seen it with nintendo for like all for like the last two years so yeah uh the next one is you talk a lot about how game development studios have never been more valuable and a lot of talk of acu- acquisition is in the air do you think we see sony acquire a left field studio not someone like blue point who or um or how smart who they've got an established relationship with someone completely out of the blue yes i think that i think that um that's just not going to change anytime soon uh so you know for just a recap for people who are listening to this like the reasons why acquisitions are so coming hot and heavy right now is capital is cheap these companies have a lot of money in the bank. Uh, that money is going to be worth less because of inflation. Like we know, like at this point, we know that inflation is going to cause this money to be less valuable. So you could try to put it into like, where are you going to, what are you going to do with that money that's in the bank? You're going to put it into these like low interest bonds or whatever right now. Like you don't have a lot of good choices 
to put your money. And so if you're a, a company that isn't related to games, a good investment right now is to buy a game studio that can create content that's going to create value for you. Um, it, it, it's like something that's been true for a long time. It's just more true now than it has ever been. And at the same time, game studios are worth more than ever because that content is so valuable. People are looking at it and saying, we need games. We need a lot of games and we need them fast. And so we need to have as many studios as possible. And that's true for Microsoft. It's also true for Sony. It's true for Tencent. Uh, it was true for Google, less so now, but Amazon's still kind of in that game. Um, and so, yeah, w w in that environment, you you're gonna like Sony has money in the bank when it comes to its gaming division. It's gonna want to spend some of that. It's gonna want to make some acquisitions. So I think that there's a good chance that we see some bigger, more left field acquisitions for sure. Yeah, it certainly, it certainly feels like it's in the air. Sony don't look at Microsoft acquiring all of the Bethesda back catalog and and that kind of how that sets them up for the next five to ten years and they don't just say oh well we have we have naughty dog and we have the next god of war and we have things like that right. it, it certainly seems like it's on the cards um speaking yeah, i of think that there's a good chance that both sony and microsoft also also start some new studios here pretty soon as yeah. well like just saying we gotta we gotta get more teams going so it's possible yeah it feels like sony haven't had a new like i suppose they have that this studio that jade raymond does uh that started recently that's kind of right and they, and yeah but that's yeah that's like a, a you know a second party really it's a third party yeah. studio that has like a one, first party deal so yeah they would like to have another naughty dog in the chamber so that they don't have to I rely think so. on just start growing another one or another like you know visual arts group like like which is like you know that team that helps with all the games and makes them look really good like yeah that's a team that's like trying to move into a position where it's going to start developing its own game so maybe you start a new one that like they take that place and kind of create the cycle anew uh yeah all that stuff's on the table yeah and our penultimate grub stack to go um i look forward to gersman sending me a cease and desist for this um this portion of the video <laughs> um do you think New Vegas 2 exists in any form? Like a name on a list or a spreadsheet that just says, let's do this? What do you think? I, yeah, I, I mean, I wonder I, if there's if that list exists, you know, it's got a million names on it. It's like, hey, these are projects that could see a significant return on investment if we could figure out how to make it happen. But the thing with New Vegas 2, something we've talked about on Grubs Next Proper is uh the, who is available to make this game bethesda game studios is going to be busy with the you know, starfield and then elder scroll 6 for the next 10 years it feels like so uh, uh then and that's exactly what, what i meant like by like these them starting up new studios maybe you start up the fallout studio maybe that's maybe that's what makes the most sense maybe you spin off uh a, a, you know a significant significant chunk of the fallout 76 team let them grow and then you put them in charge for the next Fallout, uh, Fallout proper game. And, that, you know, people will say, oh, no, Fallout 76, I hate that. But you probably haven't played it in a long time. They got into a good place. Um, so, you know, I, and Microsoft would be like, no, we're not going to do Fallout 76 again. Let's like, we'll, we'll do this like a real Bethesda game studio game. Uh, but like, this is all, it's so, so early. Like, I think it might be a name on the list. It's, it's something they don't want to let go of maybe it's not new vegas too but there will be another fallout game uh and so yeah i, I think they will find a way to make that happen new vegas 2 specifically um i, I don't know i mean you, obsidian's also busy so and they own obsidian but also very busy for a very long time so i just don't i i don't know i don't think it's anywhere beyond a list like yeah. but i do think it's probably on a list somewhere yeah, it's, it seems incomprehensible to me that they would acquire Fallout and then wait for BGS to get through Starfield yeah. and Elder Scrolls because that would be like 2030 or 2032 before it came out. Inconceivable, yes. I agree. Like a new real Fallout game within five years seems like something that has to happen. Yeah. To, to make uh, If Game Pass is really going to be Game Pass, if it's really going to be the Netflix of games, you've got to find a way to get some of these things going on a, on a much faster cadence. I know... Game development takes longer than ever right now. Five years is going to be the minimum for most of these big games. That just means, that means you spend more of that money to make more studios. That's kind of what that means. Definitely. And finally, you stop at a gas station and you have $15. What is the grub snack? Yeah, I um, I will do a, a roller hot dog occasionally. Uh, I like I like gas station food. I, I'm I'm not I'm not above I'm not above it. I'm like that's right where I'm at. It's like gas station food. Um, but then I'll get like um, <sighs> corn nuts. Maybe I'll get like a, an energy drink. Um, and then uh, fifteen dollars. I think I'm getting pretty close to my limit there. But then I'll probably I don't know. I'll probably get like a like a beef jerky. Like I want like you, you can't get a big like that's an entire fifteen dollars right there. But I'll get like a beef jerky stick or something like yeah. that, and I'll be good to go. 
what is your energy drink drink of choice? I'm a big energy drink man myself. Uh, I, I, I like Red Red Bull uh, uh, Zero Sugar. Yeah, Zero mm. Sugar. I think it's what it is. Yes, I, I, I like that one. Um, I'm like trying to find a better one because I feel like that one's not doing anything to the old noggin anymore. It's like that caffeine just doesn't even, I don't even feel it anymore. But uh, the other ones are often too, I, I don't know. And I, I'm just used to the way Red Bull tastes. So I'm like, I, I still like that. At this point, I'm just drinking it for the taste, which is a wild thing. I don't know. I'll take recommendations. If you want to, if you're an energy drink, man, I'll, I want to hear I some think, good recommendations. I think the Monster Zero line is fairly solid. Okay. Uh, it's, it's like... It doesn't taste particularly like an energy drink. It doesn't give you that real okay. kind of death at the end of it. But um, right. I don't know how much of it at this point is just indoctrination because um, sure. I, 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 I drink them so frequently. It's something I want mm -hmm. to cut down on, but also there's so much to do. There's there's really there's, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no time. Right. To I mean, down. I have an espresso machine at, at, at upstairs. My wife got me a few years ago was for a Christmas present. And I use that all the time. So I'm like, I'm still getting my caffeine in other places. And I drink a ton of water. I think I got this mm. huge big old boy of water here. It's like two gallons or something like that. And I'll, you know, so I drink a lot of water, but I, I still like at the end of a work day, uh, you, you know, I'll get, I'll get done pretty early because I would try to get started pretty, pretty early. And I'm like, I, I kind of still have to deal with the kids and do a bunch of stuff. I need something to get keep going. And also like a reward after getting through the day. So that's kind of how I treat my Red Bull. Like, you know, 3 p.m. I'm going to go get one of those and, and treat myself. But uh, I need to find something else to put in that spot. Jeff, where can people find you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at Jeff Grubb. I, uh, I tweet a lot, though, so I always warn people, like, think about it. Really think about it if you're going to do the follow. Maybe don't. Maybe don't. Uh, I don't blame you. But um, yeah, there's a link to my Discord in there. Uh, I've got a great community of people who are into GameSpeed and GameSpeed Decides and, and Last of the Nintendo Dogs and Grub Snacks, which are all my shows. Uh, the first couple of those, you could find those uh, on any podcast platform. Grub Snacks is on Giant Bomb Premium, so just go to GiantBomb.com slash upgrade. But I think you watch the first. You watch most, like, some of those Grub Snacks selects on the giant bomb channel kind of see if it's your thing and if it is uh i do recommend getting that that are upgrading because you can come and interact with me and then there's a bunch of other great content on giant bombs so yeah that, that's pretty much it uh but yeah man thanks for having me on this has been so much fun thanks a lot for joining me uh, i look forward to when it is somewhat safe to go to a physical event and yes. we can meet up in person and say can you believe they've still not announced the new fallout it's, tw it's 2030 <laughs> now they're just not doing it all those people with pit boy <laughs> masks and they've just not <laughs> yep. done it <laughs> yep exactly yep that's what we'll do uh what a strange industry it's only getting stranger eh? yeah every day every day it's it's what makes it fun is yeah. that it is small but weird and i can totally dig that that's what i keep doing it for thanks jeff thank you man